Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome this morning. It's good to see you. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself, our associate pastor, Kathleen Stoles, the entire congregation here. It's good to see you back here at this 11 o'clock service. And so uh, thanks for joining us. Hope that each one of you will take uh, some time and there's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew that you'll pass, pass it down and then back towards the center. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. And if you are visiting with us, maybe for the first time, I want to say a special word of welcome to you. Hope you'll take some time and share with us your contact information. We'd love to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. So we hope that you'll give us the opportunity to do that. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of announcements as we're getting started. So first of all, um, we're getting back into this mode of the new year, and so there's a lot of things to take a look at in the bulletin, so I do encourage you to take a look at everything. Um, but one thing that I will lift up in particular, it's happening today, we have a welcome back uh, party and barbecue, and that's gonna be taking place from four to six today. And um, so I hope that you'll be able to go home, you know, uh, watch the Eagles and uh, you know, see that wrap up and then get over here. Um, so four o'clock we start. And we're going to have food, we're going to have games, um, we're going to have music. And so the food and the music are going to be over here in Boker Hall. And then across the way, we're going to have games. So this really is something for the whole family. We hope that you'll um, take some time, reconnect with the folks here at the church. And uh, I think that it'll be a great uh, chance for us to uh, just gather together as a church. Uh, second thing is we have a reconciling ministries team who has been working and meeting. And the next step in their process is that they put together a survey um, to gauge kind of the where the congregation is with respect to the inclusion of LGBTQ persons uh, in the life of the church. And so we want to make that available to you. There is, a, uh, there is a link that's provided in the bulletin. You can also get to it through our app. And then finally, there are some paper copies of the survey out in the hallway as well. But I really would encourage you, if you can, to fill it out online because um, what all we're going to do with the paper copies is we're going to take them and input them into the electronic tools so that it's easier for us to kind of tally up and tabulate the data at the end of the day. So I hope that you'll take some time. Uh, each one of these surveys is just uh, about you know five minutes or so. So take some time and, uh, and, and go through that. It's really important to help the Reconciling Ministries team to be able to take their next steps. Next thing is uh, we're doing something new, and that is we're going to be offering a daily devotional through the app. And I'm pretty excited about this. I've been kind of thinking about it for a while and um, looking forward to over the next four weeks. So we're going to commit initially to doing this for four weeks over the course of this sermon series. And we're going to be looking at the prophets in our daily devotions. And so what it's designed to do is to help you to engage a little bit more with the Old Testament prophets. And it's something that you can do uh, relatively, you know, five, ten minutes uh, over coffee in the morning. There's a brief scripture passage. There is a little bit of a reflection and then a couple questions um, to think about your relationship with God or your relationship with the people around you. And that's how the questions are kind of oriented. So I hope that you will take some time, look through that. And again, if you haven't downloaded the app, you know, this is a good opportunity for you to uh, do that. It's available both for Apple and for Android. And the last thing I want to share is that we have a blood drive that's coming up on the 12th. So that's Thursday. And there's information about how you can sign up for that uh, in the bulletin as well. So I think that those are all the announcements, at least for the moment. And uh, Kathleen, will you lead us in the call to worship? Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to stand as you're able and comfortable and join me in our call to worship. Again and again, when your people wandered from your holy calling and allowed injustice and hurt to reign, you, you sent, sent your, your prophets, prophets to lead us back to your truth. When we felt lost and hopeless, you sent men and women who cast their vision for the future. And at the moment when we most needed to hear from you, you sent your son Jesus. Today we gather to hear from him once more, to give us hope and a vision of the world as it could and one day will be.
may be seated. I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Lord, let this be. Show us how. And love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, let this be. Take us where we need to go. Let your love be the lens that lets us see the power that enlivens our lives, the light that points to the path, and the very grace that saves us. Now let us take a few moments in silence to ponder these prayerful words. Hear these words of assurance. Return to the Lord your God, for God is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Friends, do you believe this? Yes, we believe. Thanks be to God. And the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment to greet those, especially those we may not know so well. Take a moment now and say hello. said you'd come share all my sorrows you said you'd be there for all my tomorrows I came so close to sending you away but just like you promised you came there to stay I just had to pray And Jesus said Come to the water Stand by my side I know you are thirsty You won't be denied I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you That for those tears I died Your goodness so great I can't understand and Lord, I know that all this was planned. I know you're here now and always will be. Your love loosed my chains and in you I'm free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, Come to the water. 
to stand by my side I know you are thirsty You won't be denied I felt every teardrop When in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died Oh Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul and I know without God I'd never be whole Savior, you've opened all the right doors and I thank you and praise you from earth's humble shores. Take me, I'm yours. And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied I felt every teardrop When in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you That for those tears I died I'd like to invite the members of the prayer shawl team to come forward and uh, join us up here. We have a few uh, shawls to dedicate. Thanks, Glenn. This morning we have three prayer shawls that we're going to be dedicating. Uh, the names are in your bulletin. Christy Spencer, David uh, Seitz, and Cindy Strzok. So thank you for being here. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for these three lives, the three people who will be receiving these beautiful prayer shawls. We pray that each one of them might feel your love as they wrap themselves in these shawls. That they might feel the prayers of this congregation as they go through their times of need. We give thanks for the prayer shawl ministry and the outreach that it provides so that many here in our congregation and friends connected to our congregation know your love and might feel your presence, O oh God. And so we give you thanks. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, do we have any children among us today? Any children? All right. Well, you're all going to be children. You're all children of God. And so we're going to talk today about the prophets. You're going to hear a lot more about the prophets from Joe. But I thought that it was really important for us just to kind of get an overview of the prophets. Now, I love the way that Joe's going to talk about um, who a prophet is and what we might think of prophets. But if I asked you what a prophet was, could you give me a, a short understanding of what a prophet is? Anybody? Because a lot of times we think they're fortune tellers. But they're not fortune tellers. They're telling us what God has impressed upon them to share with us. And so in the scriptures, there are 15 or 16 prophets. And if you look at, at the Bible, 
it, the books that are the prophets, it's almost as big as the New Testament. So the prophets are really, really important. They lived at all different times, basically in the same part of the world, of course, but they lived hundreds of years apart. And their message was basically the same because people don't change. We're all separated from God in some kind of way and the prophets had it impressed upon them by God that they needed to tell us something about what it's like to be separated from God, what it's like to have nothing. And the prophet Isaiah, well now this is a children's message, the prophet Isaiah actually ran around in his underwear for three years <laughs> to let people know what it was like to have nothing. Now we don't have to quite do that, but would any of you be willing to run around in your underwear for three years to tell people what it's like to have? No, no. We just have to look at... There's a better story than that. <laughs> well, this is a children's message. Oh. <laughs> you can share the other message. Maybe I will. <laughs> okay. I set you up for that mm -hmm. one. Um, so then, of course, we hear that the prophets also, a few of the prophets, were told there's going to be someone special coming who's really going to carry this message of prophecy about God's love and God's mercy and God's expectations of us. And of course, that person who was to come was who? Jesus, right, right. So that's kind of a little background to what you're gonna be hearing. That's the children's version. So let's, let's pray. <coughs> Thank you, God, for always being with us. Help us to obey your command to love you and to love all people and your whole world every day. Thank you for forgiving us when we fail, and thank you for your grace to try and try and try again. Amen.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all my heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all who burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of God for the people of God. All right, so I do want to tell you that story. <laughs> so Isaiah was naked, right? Uh, yeah. um, the there's a lot of nakedness among the prophets at God's behest, actually. Um, and it was a way of showing basically the shame of Israel. Um, but when I mentioned to a colleague the other day that I was going to be uh, talking about the prophets, he pointed out a story that I often think about too and it's it's from Ezekiel now Ezekiel is one of the more challenging prophets to understand and the imagery is very rich and he's also notable that he argued with God over one particular thing that God asked him to do and the challenge was to Ezekiel I want you to make the people understand how difficult it's going to be when Babylon comes up against you and they uh, lay siege to the city and he says, okay, I want you to demonstrate that the people will have no fuel to cook with, okay? Therefore, I want you to cook all your food for the next year over, according to the NRSV, human excrement. At this, Ezekiel says, oh no, <laughs> I am not doing that, right? To which God responds, okay, okay, I'll let you cook it over cow dung. To which Ezekiel says, okay, I can deal with that. <laughs> so the prophets are pretty surprising to us, you know, um, and amazing, honestly. So in addition this week to returning to the regular schedule, we're talking in this new, uh, we're doing a new series, right? And you know that already. And why do we want to talk about the prophets? Well, I want to talk about the prophets in part because they're fun stories, but also because I think A... There are stories that we don't know enough about. Um, and B, I think one of the challenges is to make them accessible. And I think one of the ways to try to make some of those stories accessible is to bring Jesus into conversation with them. Um, and I think this also helps us to achieve another goal, which is to break down this kind of sense in which we think we understand Jesus. Sometimes when we look through a different lens, we get a fresh perspective on who Jesus is. And that's important because I think the biggest risk to the church frequently is the idea that we come to think that we understand everything about who Jesus is. We've heard this message before. We know what he's about. And so it doesn't surprise us. It doesn't shock us. It doesn't, you know, really touch us or reach us anymore. So those are the reasons why we're doing this. And then um, through the devotionals, We'll give you the opportunity to take a look at some passages of scripture from the prophets so that you can get a better flavor for what they're talking about. So that's kind of where all this is going, and I hope that over the next few weeks you come to learn something about the prophets. Uh, let's take a moment, though, as we get started. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures. We know that sometimes we need, um, we need patience, and we need wisdom, and we need insight to understand it and to understand it better. And we pray that you'd be at work in our hearts and our minds. 
uh, over these next few weeks as we hear about the prophets. We pray that you might be present uh, for us today and help us to understand Jesus as a prophet. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if you've ever had any uh, of these. Did you ever have one of these? Watch this now. You may rely on it, right? So have you ever had one of those magic eight balls? Right? Everybody's had a magic eight ball. So I learned some things about the magic eight ball. So the magic eight ball originally um, came from an idea. There was a, a, a man, his mom was a psychic, right? And so she ran this scam where she would sit you down across the table from you. And inside this wooden box, she would have a tablet, which apparently you could swap out kind of a, from underneath somehow. But it had a limited number of responses that would show up on this tablet. It was like a, you know, like a, like a slate you would use in school, you know, um, back in the day. And so there was this slate, and it would have this limited number of answers. And when people would be asking the spirits a question, there'd be a recording of this scratching sound that sounded like writing on the slate, right? And so the son was like, you know, there's, this, is, this is good. Like, we could repackage this. So originally, he repackaged it as a crystal ball. Um, but that didn't sell near as well as when um, the Brunswick Billiard Company eventually got hold of this idea. And they started to package it as a magic eight ball. Okay. So if you don't know, there are 20 responses that the magic eight ball can give you. Did you know that? That seems like a lot, like, hidden in that little thing. Ten of them are affirmative, five of them are, uh, you know, negative, and five of them are uncertain. So you can do the math and work out your probabilities, but the idea being that if you want the answer, ask the question so that you get the affirmative, right? Because it's more likely to come up that way. So anyway. So I think that one of the things about the prophets is that we tend to see the prophets as the people with the magic eight ball. You can ask them a question. And some of this is historic. So in other words, uh, another word that shows up sometimes, in the, especially in the Old Testament, for a prophet is a seer. The idea is somebody sees the future. And there is that to some degree. And especially if you look at um, Isaiah and Micah and some of these uh, prophets, you get these echoes of Jesus' life very clearly. There's no question about that. But what I would argue is that the job of the prophet is not primarily to tell the future. The prophet's job primarily is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. And that's really what it's about. So I want you to bear that in mind. You know, so if you're thinking about the prophet as the person with the magic eight ball, think of the prophet as the one who's charged with telling the truth. And the way that this works out is the prophets begin with an experience of God, like a really powerful, strong, visionary experience of God that, that propels them into this work, sometimes very reluctantly. So there's a famous passage in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah talks about how unwilling he is to be a prophet. And he says, you know, I've tried not speaking in this name, in the name of the Lord, because that's how you would introduce what you're saying. Thus says the Lord. Jeremiah says, I've tried not speaking in this name, but when I don't speak, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. That's what he says. Later on, you know, Paul will also talk about the idea that, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Kind of like, this has been laid on me. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to stop it, but this is what I have to do. Period. And so that's the kind of thing that you're dealing with with respect to the prophets. Now, let's talk for a minute about who do we mean by the prophets? Kathleen alluded to this. We have a, a slide, I think, with the major prophets and the minor prophets. So for the major prophets, we've got Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Those are the three longer books. That's why we call them major. And then we've got 12 prophets who are the minor prophets. Now, if you were to talk to uh, a Jew, a rabbi, about prophets and which are the prophetic books, they would have a little bit different answer. They understand a little bit differently. But from a Christian perspective, we talk about the three, and then we talk about the 12. And the 12 includes, you know, people that you might think about, people like, um, for example, Jonah. You know, you all know his story about the fish and all that kind of thing. But there are also people that probably you've never heard read in church, like ever. Haggai, right? Have you ever heard a sermon on Haggai? I've never preached one. Nahum, no, not too much either. 
So there's some that we just kind of set aside in large part. And one of the reasons why is sometimes their, you know, their preaching was so specific you know, that it just, it's hard to get it to carry into the modern day in a way that will speak to people. But there were other prophets, too, that are described in the Bible who didn't necessarily get a whole book named after them. I mean, you've got Elijah and Elisha. They do a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, their stories are told through the lens of other stories. We don't have a book of what they said. So anyway, a little bit about the prophets and what they do. Now, when we read the New Testament, when we think about who the prophets are in the New Testament, there's really only one person that typically comes to mind. This guy dressed the part of the prophet. He looked the part of the prophet. He, you know, talked like a prophet. Who am I speaking of? John the Baptist, right? So John the Baptist, who every year when we get into Advent, we talk about him. We talk about his message. And he's this crazy guy that shows up in camel you know, he dresses in camel hair, not like good camel hair suits, but like just camel hair. Like that's what he wears, right? He shows up and it says, you know, he's hardcore. He lives out in the desert. He eats locusts, right? That's how he takes care of himself. He eats locusts and honey. That's it. The guy is hardcore. And he dresses exactly like Elijah did a thousand years before him. He knows what he's doing. He's parking himself kind of squarely in this kind of river of the prophetic experience in Israel. He says, yep, God's called me. I'm part of that too. And he steps into that role and he embraces it. And one of the things that he embraces is the message that the prophets forever have been preaching. And that is the message of repentance. So when we get into Advent we are struck immediately with this message from Isaiah, or I'm sorry, from uh, John the Baptist that says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And not only does he say that, I mean, that sounds kind of gentle, but he's talking about the idea that the ax is already at the root of the tree, right? Everybody who does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And you're sitting there thinking, hey, it's the first Sunday of December, really? Come on, like, shouldn't we talk about sugar plums and stuff like that? But that's not how the prophetic work goes. The prophets call the people to repentance. They call them to change lives. They call them to transformation, right? That's part of our mission statement, the idea of transformation, changed life because of what God has done. And so this is part of what it means to be a prophet. Now, Jesus, when he comes along, we uh, tend to think about him in a little bit different vein. We say, well, Jesus wasn't kind of like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was nuts, man. He was crazy. He was out there. But interestingly enough, when you read through Matthew and Mark, and you get to the place in about chapter 3, chapter 4, where John is thrown into prison, the very next line is, from that day, Jesus went about preaching. What's his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No difference. No difference whatsoever. And we perceive it as being different, but in reality, the message is the same. And it's this message that's carried through what it means to be a prophet in the uh, nation of Israel. And that was the core. That was the core of what they did. Frequently, the way the prophets would talk to the people of Israel is they'd put it in the context of this, like a marital relationship between God and the people of Israel. This metaphor keeps coming up over and over again. Israel, why are you so unfaithful to me? Over and over and over again. This is the language that's used. Why are you so unfaithful to me? And it's painful to read. I mean, sometimes the issue is literally the people of Israel have gone after foreign gods. Sometimes um, the issue is that in the face of being assaulted by an outside force, they've made alliances with other nations that can't be trusted. And so the prophet says, that's eh, not a good idea. Other times it's about, you've grown so wealthy that the people who are in charge are oppressing those who live at the edge. 
You've grown so accustomed to pleasure, you don't know what it is to deny yourself. All of these things, the prophets say, calling the people to repentance. They're calling them back, essentially, to their first love. Why have you been so unfaithful to me? Interestingly enough, one of the things that the prophets challenge sometimes is even the people's attachment to their religion. Now, isn't that strange? But you find these passages in the prophets to say, what is it to me? What is it to me, all of your sacrifices? What is it to me, all of your rivers of olive oil that you pour out thinking that somehow I'll be pleased with them? There's this fascinating thing that happens where the prophets have the ability to question everything and everyone. They have this ability to question everything and everyone, and they do it. Are there people in your life? One, two, there we go. And so one of my questions for you this morning is, are there people in your life who serve this function for you? I think that everybody needs someone to call them on their stuff. When you're starting to you know, lay it on very thickly, right? When the self-deception is kind of starting to pile up in your life, when, you know, the self-righteousness is becoming very evident in your interactions with the people around you, who is it that calls you on that? It might be your husband, might be your wife, might be your kids, might be your mom and dad. It might be a friend that you've known forever. But I would say that everybody needs somebody like that in their lives. Now, the reality is we don't want somebody like that in our lives. None of us do. But we need somebody like that in our lives. That's just the way it goes. That's what we need. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 12. If you actually were to open up your Bible and take a look at it, um, it's interesting to see how Jesus spends this entire chapter arguing with the religious leaders of the day. And he kind of starts from this place where um, he's talking, he tells a story about a vineyard. Remember a couple weeks ago, we told a story about a vineyard? This is a different story about a vineyard, but it's still about a vineyard. Why is it about a vineyard? Well, it's because Isaiah once told a story about a vineyard. So Jesus is very much, you know, drawing on the people who went before using the same images, the same ideas, to call the people of Israel back to repentance. So he tells a story about a vineyard. And then it goes on from there, there's a very tricky question that's asked, is it right to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And Jesus has to deal with that. And then there's another question that's asked. And this one really comes out of left field, where The people say, let me throw you a hypothetical, Jesus. Let's say a woman has been married seven times. She keeps outliving her husbands. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? To which Jesus is kind of like, all right, I'm done with you. I've just had it. Like, these questions are stupid. Why do you want to ask me these things, right? And finally, he loses his patience and kind of tells them off. But in the midst of all these interactions all this back and forth, there's one guy who comes with a serious question. And he gets a serious answer. And his question is, what's the most important commandment? And this is a question that Jesus wants to answer because this is a question actually that's asked pretty frequently of rabbis. According to Jewish tradition, there are like 613 commandments that you see in the Torah. Some of them positive, you shall do this, many of them negative, you shall not do that. But the question is, when there are 613 things you've got to worry about, how do you know what's most important? That's a legitimate question. Because it's really easy to get off in the weeds and think, this is really important, I'm going to focus on this. Really, is that right? 
And so the people would come to the rabbis and say, just tell us, what do you think is most important? Tell us. And that's the question that's being asked. And Jesus' response is, well, love God and love people. Now, that sounds a lot like our mission statement again, right? We love God, we serve people. We talk about serving people rather than loving people because, in part, it's too easy for us to drift into the idea that love is just about an emotion as opposed to doing something for someone, right? Love, when Jesus uses that term, is always active. It's doing something. So love God, love people. Now, that to us, that sounds very, like, basic. It's so simple. I don't get it. But understand, to the people who lived then, this is really important. It only sounds basic to us because we've heard it a million times. Again, we've domesticated Jesus. We don't understand what power that had to say, love God and love people, and that's enough. But the person he's talking to, the the Pharisee who asked him this question, definitely understands it. And as they're standing there, again, back to the idea that, you know, the prophet is someone who is able to ask these hard questions, who's able to cut through all the, you know, the noise around us. The guy who asked the question says, yeah, I think you're right. And as they're standing in this temple, as they're standing, you know, they're probably hearing the little lambs, you know, bleeding all around them. They're smelling the smoke from the fire. They're standing there, and what the man says is, yeah, I think that's a lot more important than sacrifices. There's this moment where everybody's able to admit, hey, the emperor's got no clothes. And it comes because of the prophetic word of Jesus. I've been reading a, a book, uh, listening to a book, and it's actually the Bruce Springsteen autobiography. Has anybody read that? The Bruce Springsteen, yeah. So I like reading, I like listening to it because he reads it. Now, I don't consider myself a great Springsteen fan. I really, I definitely admire, what's that? <laughs> I admire his work, but he's not necessarily my favorite. I. <laughs> So anyway, so if you, well, are you, are you listening to his autobiography right now? Yes, that's good. You start. It's good. So what I like about his book is it is, at the same time, incredibly pretentious and incredibly real. And when I say it's incredibly pretentious, he goes on for pages and pages and pages talking about... Um, you know, what it means to play a great live show, like the emotions around that. And I get that, like you want that insight into the artist's, you know, mindset. But at the same time, it's very much self, it's self, right, is really at the forefront. He talks about spending days and weeks and months in the studio working on albums and how much money he spent working on albums to get it exactly right, right? And you can say, well, that's vision. That's what it takes, you know. But also, it's very self-indulgent. But what I like about it is as he's telling the story, he's talking about going out, and he's talking about playing a show, and it might be for 3,000 people or 5,000 people, or it might be for 20,000 people. He's talking about the idea that when the house lights go down and, you know, all the amplifiers are turned off, And that guitar, that iconic guitar, goes back in its case. That he would walk out of that arena and he didn't have a home. For years, he didn't ever own a place. He would walk out of there with no family, really to speak of, to go home to. His life was touring and recording, and that was it. And there was an emptiness about it. And it's really fascinating to me how you can go from this pretension to this very brutal reality. 
and how one person can kind of serve as their own prophet. Now, it took a lot of practice to get there, I think. It talks about how much time he spent in therapy, right? Trying to figure out why this was. But to me, there's a parallel here between what the prophets are trying to say to the people of Israel and to us. Haven't you forgotten something? Isn't there more that you should be considering? How have you allowed everything else to take the place of this relationship that should be primary in your life? And so, what I think I'd like to do is just leave you with a couple questions for you to consider as you're going through this week. And one question is about loving God and one question is about loving your neighbor. So first, I want you to think about this question in terms of loving God. So if you're able to put yourself in God's shoes, imagine for a second you're God and you're looking at the relationship between you and God from God's perspective. If you're God, do you feel loved? Do you feel loved by you? Does God feel loved by you? Are you spending any time talking to each other? Are you spending any time with each other? Do you give a thought toward God a few times during the day? How does God know that you care? That's the first question. The second question is with respect to your neighbor. And when I say neighbor, I could be talking about, you know, your family, your colleagues, your friends, you know, strangers, people that you run into on the street um, in the course of your day-to-day -day activities, people that you meet up with. When's the last time you went out of your way? Like, really made some effort to show somebody that you really cared about them that they were important to you, that you love them. When's the last time you did that? So these two questions, as we get started on this year, I want you to kind of take them with you and think about them as you go through the week. Because here's the reality. Jesus the prophet is, he's not necessarily the friend we want, but I think for all of us, when it comes right down to it, he is a friend that we need. Amen?
be seated. In just a moment, we're going to receive uh, today's offering, and as we do that, I want to encourage you to think about um, those who are suffering uh, in the aftermath of the hurricane. The United Methodist Committee on Relief is already at work in places like the Bahamas, and so uh, if you'd like to make a donation to help them in what they're doing, uh, I know that um, that's something that we always try to do in an event like this. And you can do that through the blue offering envelopes that are in the backs of the pews. You can also make an, uh, an electronic gift as well um, through the push pay system. And uh, there will be a place there for UMCOR. So just label your blue envelope UMCOR or the Bahamas and we'll make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. Know that uh, your gifts go 100% to help those in need when you give through the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And so we thank you for your generous support. Let's offer now uh, our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. With its worries and its scare Are you tired and friendless? Have you almost lost your way? Jesus will help you Just call on Him today He is always there Hearing every prayer Faithful and true Walking by our side in His love we'll hide all the day through. When you get discouraged, just remember what to do. Reach out to Jesus. Come on and reach out to Jesus. I said reach out to Jesus. He's reaching out to Join me in our prayer of dedication. Lord, bless these offerings, the fruit of our labor. Remind us that our work, that our substance, is only possible because of the things you first gave us, the talents, gifts, and people that you created us to be. When we forget, remind us that it is you who made us and not the other way around. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So 
So I want to just lift up a couple of prayer uh, concerns that have come. Um, so first for all the victims of the hurricane, of course, and also for those who, who are uh, going to be part of the response. Um, and that includes some uh, folks from, uh, from the joint base here um, I know about who are going to be part of uh, providing relief in a place that desperately needs it. We want to continue to pray uh, for Karen Jackson. Karen underwent some surgery, and uh, we want to continue to lift her up. We want to pray for Chip Eaton, for uh, traveling mercies for him, and also for Meg, um, Dorothy's uh, daughter, uh, who is uh, going through treatment for cancer. So let's take some time now. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for uh, your great gifts that you've poured into our lives. We thank you for the challenge that you give us, um, not only the comfort, but the challenge. Because we know that sometimes we need to be reminded of what's really important. We need to be um, called back to those things that are really important and back into that relationship that sometimes we neglect, sometimes we let go. And so we just pray that as we are gathered here that you might uh, continue to bless us with a spirit of wisdom and discernment to understand all those places in our lives that you need to reach into and touch. Lord, we lift our prayers and concerns for those who have been named here, certainly for the victims of this storm uh, and all those who are uh, coming to the aid of those who are in need. Lord, we pray that you might bless them um, with protection and with grace. We pray for all those whose lives have been lost and for their families and loved ones who um, are missing them and grieving for not only the lives, but the homes and um, the places of employment and just the utter destruction in many places throughout the Caribbean and especially in the Bahamas. Lord, we pray um, that you watch over um, this nation uh, for our leadership um, at every level of government. And Lord, we pray for wisdom um, to be able to help um, those who are affected by the hurricane here. We pray uh, for a discernment uh, as we continue to work uh, for a brighter uh, future. Lord, we are grateful for everything that you've done for us. We are grateful for the way that your love calls us to account. And we're grateful for the way that your love comforts us when we are hurting. And we pray that we might keep those two things in mind and live in that tension between them as we go through this week. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who uh, led his disciples in this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So friends, as we go forth in this place, we know that God goes with us. We know that Jesus the prophet is maybe not the friend we want, but Jesus the prophet is certainly sometimes the friend that we need. So we go forth by his grace, by his power, and with his challenge on our lives. Go forth in the strength of Jesus. Amen.